Welcome. Uh, so my talk today is on using Composer with WordPress. Uh, so just out of curiosity, how many people have actually heard of Composer before? How many people actually have played around with Composer? And how many people actually use it regularly? Okay, good. And we got a good crowd. So, uh, so my handle on Twitter is WP Scholar. Um, if you want to, you can ping me on there. I'm also on Slack under the same handle. Um, not sure if anyone's really been mentioning uh, this at all, but every single talk has its own channel in the in Slack, um, mine included. So. If you need to uh, follow up uh, questions that you didn't get to ask or uh, whatnot after we're done, you can just post in there and I'll be monitoring that and we'll, we'll be able to respond to it. Um, all of the slides are on this link. You don't have to worry too much about typing it. If you just go on Twitter, um, it went out about four minutes ago. Uh, so you should be able to find that. Um, Except I didn't put the right hash in there, so you'll probably have to go there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so the, the hashtag, I forgot. But uh, so anyways, uh, so we'll be talking about using Composer with WordPress. And if you go to that link, uh, there the slides are up there. There's actually, uh, it's not the first time I've given this talk, but it is the first time I've given it in Atlanta. Um, and there is actually a video, um, just in case you want to rewatch it. Uh, there's also a forum there, if you're interested, I've got a, a Learning Composer uh, email course uh, with step-by-step -step email uh, instructions. So you'll get kind of get a, an email, kind of explains Composer, just, uh, and then another one, you know, kind of showing you how to set it up and takes you step-by-step -step through the process if you want to do that. Um, and there's a few other links to resources that uh, you won't find unless you go there. Uh, some people who are also good advocates of Composer within WordPress uh, have some great stuff that you can find there as well. So basically we're going to start out with what is Composer. Essentially if you've ever used, uh, how many of you have ever used a tool like NPM or Bower or anything like that? So essentially that's the same kind of thing uh, except it's for PHP and not for JavaScript, right? So it's a it's a dependency management tool. So what it does is it'll actually allow you to manage your project dependencies as well as your version. So when I say project dependencies, there's some tools out uh, that allow you to kind of globally manage dependencies. Think things like Pear and things like that that'll allow you to set up some global things. Composer allows you to set up global things as well, but it's more useful to have project specific dependencies. So if you have three projects that all have the same dependency but different versions, uh, you're not stuck with having to change out versions of that thing. Uh, so why, why use it? So that's kind of the, the most common question. When you have a new tool, um, everybody wants to know why it's important and how it could really help them in their workflows. So, uh, the first thing it does is it helps you eliminate duplication. Um, it basically provides you with the ability to have a canonical source where your code can live. Uh, so now instead of having um, multiple repositories containing similar code, uh, you can actually give it a home and uh, just point all your projects uh, to that particular code base. It allows you to have consistent versioning uh, one of the things that we ran into with the project that I started, uh, I worked on when I first started doing development, uh, we were trying to create a product, uh, essentially a platform for law firms on top of WordPress. And as we got more and more sites that were using it and new features that were being developed, uh, it kind of got to the point where, uh, A, we had mo almost had multiple versions per each client because they all had different feature requests. Um, but the reason for that was mainly because it was really hard to track what version of the code each client had. Uh, so it got to the point where we actually had multiple versions. It got to be quite a, quite a nightmare. One of the other things it helps with is actually encourage you, encourages you to develop in a modular way. Uh, and in doing that, it encourages you to reuse your code. And it makes it easy for you to do that. And so I'm going to kind of run through what some of those features are. 
So the first thing that it does is it allows you to have automatic package installation. So you can type a simple command, it'll go find that thing and download it at the most recent uh, stable version. That's kind of what it does by default. You can change those versions and that kind of thing. Um, but it'll actually just go and find it and automatically download it and install it. Save you the trouble of having to go hunt it down, especially if it's something that you use often. It allows for bulk package updates. So let's say you install 10, 15, 20, 100 dependencies. Uh, it will actually, with a single command, go and update all of those uh, to the most recent versions or whatever your rules happen to allow. One of the biggest benefits is that it allows, it has auto-loading built in. So when you include a dependency, uh, normally in PHP, you have to drop a file somewhere, then you have to include that file, and then you can start writing code against the code that is in that library or code base. In Composer, assuming that the, the package is set up correctly, uh, you can actually just do a Composer require, and it will include that, that thing in your project. Uh, anybody else who copies your project down will easily be able to get those things. Uh, but the coolest thing is that you can just start coding against uh, that code base, you never have to do an include or require or any of that, um, it just works. And it gets loaded exactly when it's needed. So if you don't happen to call it uh, in a particular page load, um, then it's not gonna get loaded. It also does recursive dependencies. Um, there are some contexts where you can run into a little bit of trouble with it, but for the most part, uh, it works really well. Uh, and if you have multiple packages that require the same dependencies, uh, if there's conflicts, it'll let you know, and that kind of thing. Package discovery. So it gives you an easy way to find out about new packages uh, that are available. Um, so if you know you're trying to do something specific, you can actually do a search and easily find, uh, most of the time, something that would, that would meet your needs. So first I wanna talk a little bit about what it takes to get it set up. Uh, Composer is one of those tools that I've used, and of all the tools that I've used, I'd say it's probably the easiest to set up. Uh, it's very little trouble uh, that it's ever given me. Um, there was a little bit of a learning curve initially, um, but, but it's the smallest learning curve of anything I've probably had to learn. Uh, and it's an extremely useful tool. So if you uh, have never tried it, at least download it, install it, play with it, um, it'll be worth it. All you have to do is go to the website, click on their getting started, they have an install method for Windows, and then for uh, Mac and uh, Linux, and it, you can get that set up in just a matter of minutes. Once you, and it is a command line tool, so if you're not familiar with the command line, uh, don't be intimidated, it's, it's a simple thing. Uh, but once you get it installed, you'll actually be able to run a command called Composer Diagnose. If there happens to be some configuration issue, uh, this command will let you know. And it will make sure that you have all the appropriate tools. Uh, it uses git, uh, so it, git is kind of a requirement, so if you don't have or use git, you'll want to make sure that you have that. Um, I was telling uh, a few people the other day that uh, if you're a developer and you don't use Git, just be aware that when I talk to people who are looking to hire developers, I tell them not to use developers that don't use version control. So if you don't use version control, you might want to think about it. Uh, so using Composer. So what are the commands, kind of how does it work? Uh, what does that look like? So Composer init uh, is basically, basically a command that will generate a, what's called a Composer JSON file which is really just a configuration file where you can set some details about your project and kind of declare what your dependencies are. Uh, so once you run this command, it will auto-create that file for you in whatever directory you're in, which usually would be your project root. Composer validate will check your composer.json file and make sure it's valid. So if you have gone in there and manually edited something, uh, you can run that command and if there's some sort of JSON syntax error or you, you use things that aren't really supported, uh, some, you made up some thing that sounds 
close to what it should be, but it's not quite there, um, this command will help you diagnose those things. As far as actually creating uh, and declaring what those dependencies are, composer, require, and then the name of package is going to essentially install uh, that thing and um, it will also add it to your JSON configuration file. So that one command will download, install, and add this to your configuration so that next time you have uh, maybe somebody else takes your project and, and downloads it, they can actually get the same version of what, of what you put in there. If you, it is possible to have dev dependencies, so if you've got a package that you use in production, you want to do it as a regular uh, dependency, you can pass this dev flag on the end here and actually have a package that is only installed for development environment. So Composer install is what you would run to actually download and install all the dependencies that are already configured in your JSON file. Uh, so if that's already been set up and somebody's done the project setup, uh, a new developer could come in and just run Composer install and they're gonna get all those PHP packages and. Uh, libraries that you had configured for this project. And again, if you are trying to do Composer install for production, you just pass this no dev, and it will uh, strip out all the dev dependencies that might be declared. So by default, if you run Composer install as a developer, you're going to get all of the production packages as well as the development packages. Uh, but in this case, with no dev, uh, this will be a production build. And then we have Composer Update, and there's a difference, difference between Composer Install and Composer Update, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on that a little bit later. But basically, this just checks all of the things that are uh, dependencies to see if there are any updates <coughs> available. And if, the, if there's updates available, and, and you can also set some rules around whether you, you want certain updates. Um, so if, if those rules are met and there are packages to be updated, it will actually bulk update anything that you have declared as a dependency for your project. I have a question. What if, if you're already like if you're familiar with like Bower or like you know or or or, 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 or N, NPM, um, like uh, how how difficult would the learning curve be for the syntax and the versus? So I have found that NPM and Bower are actually not as robust as Composer. Uh, There's some things about Composer, which I'll explain a little bit later, that those package managers don't have, right. uh, which allow you to do, uh, Composer allows you to do a, some more interesting things that give you a little better control over your dependencies. Uh, uh, but ultimately, if you've used those before, uh, there's not a huge difference. Uh, okay. So learning curve is not that big. <coughs> So you can also update individual packages by running Composer Update and then the name of the package. And that way, if you just wanted to make sure you update a single thing, you can do that. Composer Remove Package will delete the package from your code and will also remove it from your Composer JSON file. Um, if you are looking for a specific package or are just trying to find something that's related to, uh, I don't know, uh, CSV parsing or something like that, uh, you can do a, a composer search package, uh, or you can actually go on the website packages.org, which is where, uh, which is the website, which is an online repository of all their packages that are available. Um, anybody can actually register their own packages on packages. And you can do a search on there as well, and it will search through all the descriptions of the packages that are available, and you'll get a nice long list of things that are related that you can then explore. So again, with packages.org, uh, in order for Composer to actually know about a package, generally it has to be on packages.org. However, it is possible for you to register your own uh, repository, essentially, um, which you can do kind of on a one-off. So you can do composer config, and it's a little bit of a long command, repositories.package.org. Uh, 
package name is what I usually do. Um, and then you say git and then the github path to that thing. And essentially it registers that with Composer that this is another place you should check for Composer repositories that we may have. And so generally you do this per each private Composer repository you have. Uh, so a lot of times on Bitbucket or something, I'll have something I'm not want to publicly register. I can run that line and then do a require for that particular package and it'll work just as if it were on the packages.org website. What is the interface from Bitbucket and it's how you do stuff like that? Um, so basically when this runs, it, it will either, if it's HTTPS, it will actually ask you for your password when it runs the Composer install. Uh, or if you're SSH, just because you already have those keys in your machine, <coughs> it'll work. So as long as any developers that are running this have that SSH access, uh, which is usually the, the route I go, then it will work. But it also makes it uh, nice and easy to share a repo, and, and if nobody has access to that particular thing, then you know that, that could be a problem. So that would be a way to keep something private, but within a team. Right, exactly. Um, so custom repositories do require a composer.json file. So you will, uh, in your private repository, need to actually do that composer init uh, so that there's enough information there when composer does come and check this private repository uh, for it to know what the package name is and uh, know that that's a composer thing that it can pull into whatever project you want it in. Um, but that's a, a pretty simple process. Uh, so let's kind of take a step back for a second and look at versions and what you can do with that. Uh, so in your configuration, typically you'll have a package name um, and then you'll have a version. And the version is very important and um, there's a few ways that you can define that. So the first one here is the exact version, um, which should be pretty obvious. Uh, whatever exact version you want installed, you just put it in there. Uh, tools like NPM and Bower, you have to be a lot more explicit uh, about your versions uh, than you do necessarily sometimes with Composer, depending on how you set things up. You can also define a range of versions, uh, so something like greater than or equal to uh, 1.0, um, but less than 2.0. So that kind of restricts what version, so it's going to expect a kind of this minimum version. Uh, but then there's also this maximum version. So um, you can also have a wild card. So the wild card is allows you to have, in this case, the 1.0 star will allow you to essentially get uh, all those bug fix uh, changes that may happen, uh, which are usually what that last number represents. And then there's this thing called next significant release, which basically says I want anything that's 1.2 or greater, but not 2.0. So it's kind of that same um, range, but it's an easier way to define, uh, define a specific range. The other cool thing that you can do is you can actually just use stability flags. Uh, so you can just say for a specific repo, instead of saying a specific version, you can just say I want this particular package at stable. And that will actually, based on semantic versioning, which we'll go into in just a second, uh, it will make sure that it gets the most recent stable version of the code. You can do RC, which stands for release candidate. Uh, so if you specifically tag things in that way, it will restrict to that or stable. Um, you can also have beta, alpha, and the uh, loosest version would be dev, which basically gives you anything, um, you know, whatever's most recent, doesn't matter, uh, it'll give you that version. So semantic versioning is something that Composer uses and is uh, kind of hardwired into the way that, uh, well, not so much hardwired in the way it works, um, but using semantic versioning in your projects will make using Composer a delight, uh, instead of just a little bit confusing. So. In semantic versioning, and this is kind of the quick version, um, but the first number basically repre represents the major version, 
And essentially, this is uh, only incremented when you make a breaking change. Uh, so if you are releasing something and it breaks older versions, you would increment this. As you'll probably note, WordPress doesn't actually use semantic versioning. Uh, they typically bump uh, with each new version that second number. Um, but of course, their goal is also to maintain backwards compatibility. Um, but that's not always going to be the case with projects. So this number increments when you make a breaking change. The second number is incremented any time you add um, new features. So anything that's backwards compatible, it doesn't break anything that you currently got, you increment this middle number. And then the last number is the patch version and is used any time that you essentially have <coughs> um, bug fixes. So bug fixes, new features, and any kind of breaking change, even if it's a bug fix, if it breaks backwards compatibility, that first number is the one you would change. So I want to go in a little bit more details on how Composer works. Uh, this will be the part where if you use NPM or Bower, you'll start to realize a little bit of difference. So the first thing is composer.json file. Um, essentially, you know, if you use the commands, this thing will get auto-generated. There will be times, uh, particularly within the context of WordPress, where you'll have to make a, a manual edit. But for the most part, um, all of this is created automatically. Uh, you can see up here we have a name, which contains the name of the package. Uh, the first part of that is what's called a vendor. So it's, it's basically a namespace ver uh, handle, essentially, um, that you use for any packages you put out. So for example, most of the stuff I put out on GitHub or wherever is going to have the WP Scholar namespace. And then Composer Demo uh, would be the name of the actual um, thing that you want to install. Um, but you know, if somebody else has a, something they call Composer Demo, uh, then they would use their handle. And so it would have a unique name. Then the description, uh, pretty obvious. You can set a license, uh, author information. You can also do things like, uh, for, for public projects, you might define um, where you go for support, where's the documentation, things like that. Um, and then down here at the bottom is the require. Uh, so these are production requirements you see here, which is the Symphony YAML uh, library. And you see the wild card, so it's basically 2.5 uh, and any bug fixes that may come along. The composer.log file, um, reading this is really not all that important. Basically, it's important to understand what the log file is and why it's there. And this is the one thing you don't get with NPM or Bower. So when you run NPM install, for the very first time, it reads your composer JSON file, figures out what your dependencies are, and installs those things. And then it will create this log file. And this log file basically contains the explicit versions uh, a reference to the explicit versions that are actually installed on your machine at this moment. Now, if you commit this composer.lock file into your Git repository, what will happen is the next time somebody runs composer install, they will get these exact versions, regardless of what the composer.json file says. Which is good, because when you're working on a team, you don't want to run, for example, if you did this with Bower, and you had kind of this wildcard set up and there were some bug fixes that came down the road, um, somebody could get a different version if they run Bower install at a later time. Uh, especially if you have, and, and as you get more loose in your definition of what can be installed, then you start to run into a lot of problems with tools like Bower and NPM. That's why you have to be more exact. But in Composer, you can actually just say, give me the most recent stable version, whether it's a bug fix or whatever, um, and it'll give you the exact same version every time until you run Composer Update, at which point it ignores this log file, goes back to the Composer JSON file, and checks for whatever the most recent version is, and it will update this file again with an exact version. So long as the team lead only runs Composer Update, then there'll never be an issue where somebody's getting newer versions of code and it's uh, breaking things because you know, this person ran this command later than somebody else after a new version came out. Wait, you mentioned something about um, 
you could actually assign um, like an update and it would, uh, like, can you explain the update thing again? So yeah, so there's the two different commands. There's update and there's install. So essentially install will always, if you have a composer lock file, will always install exactly what versions are defined here. Uh -huh. um, and composer update will ignore the lock file and always go to the JSON file. So if you have this range of uh, versions available that are allowed to be downloaded and installed, um, if you run composer, if the whole team ran composer update, depending on when you ran composer update, uh, you would get potentially different versions and then developers are working against different versions of the code, uh, which obviously never ends well. Right. So. well I got, is there any way that say you want to, say you want to uh, have uh, the same update go to um, all of the members of development team? Can you create, like, you, is there some way that you could be able to say, create a command that will update that box file that distributed to all members? So essentially, that's what the, the so so the question was: uh, Is there a way to kind of send a notification or an update to the team, uh, letting them know that there's been a change to the lock? Okay. Yeah. So basically, the um, process is that anytime you pull down new code, you should probably go ahead and just run Composer install. Mm -hmm. uh, that way, the entire team is always getting the latest. <coughs> um, so there, you can set a process where you tell your devs to do that every time. If they forget, you know, then that could, could mess things up. Uh, but a lot of times you can use tools like um, uh, Git has post receive hooks and things like that. Okay. And you can use tools like Gulp and stuff to automate so that every time they pull down, they don't have to run anything. Uh, Gulp just sets up that post receive hook. And then when you do a pull in Git, it automatically will run this behind the scenes. And no one even has to think about it. Okay. So the, so the vendor directory. So the vendor directory um, is essentially where all of your packages go. Uh, so when you do require a dependency, by default it will end up in this vendor directory. Uh, that sounds like a bad thing at first, um, but you also have to remember that composer autoloaders means you don't have to know where exactly that code lives. You just start using it. Uh, so it can drop the code here, and you can just code against it and not even worry about where it is, um, but it will all live in here. So if for some reason, let's say you're doing a WordPress plugin and you have libraries and they need to go with the plugin into WordPress.org, you can commit the entire vendor directory into your project, uh, and that code will ship. Uh, but a lot of times you actually want to get ignore your vendor directory um, because the repository itself doesn't need to contain code that you're not actually going to directly change. Uh, you want to change it on its original source. Uh, if it's your code or if it's th third party code, you're not really going to change it, so why do you need it in version control? So essentially the vendor directory is a black box where your code lives and you can just start coding against the, the known dependencies. The only thing you do have to do is just make sure that the autoload file that gets created for you, um, after every time you include a new dependency, this file gets updated for you. Um, you just have to do a require uh, whatever the path is, vendor slash autoload.php. And that basically, for any package that has autoloading, will make sure things work perfectly. So how do we use Composer with WordPress? So Composer, again, is a generic PHP tool. Uh, so if you do general PHP work, it is awesome. Uh, but specifically within the context of WordPress, uh, one of the use cases is you have a custom plugin or theme, and you want to use uh, dependency management to make sure that you don't have to write all the custom code that this other library provides you. And, in, and again, in this case, you would actually commit that vendor directory where all that code lives so that it would actually be available for those that install the plugin or the theme. The other use case is a client <coughs> website or application. Uh, so this is generally something that's professionally managed. Um, the client is hands-off. 
Uh, but when you do turn the project over, you'll probably want to make sure that that vendor directory is there, maybe in the repository if they use the repository, or um, typically if it's, uh, you know, you deploy it to the site, uh, you'll probably package it up in a way that they get the full code base. So as far as WordPress goes, the first thing you'll need to do is composer require, and WordPress is a dependency because you're creating a WordPress site, you need WordPress for it to run, uh, or an application, you need it WordPress for it to run. If you're doing a WordPress plugin or a theme, then WordPress is assumed it's already running. Uh, it, this wouldn't be a dependency. So this is more for your custom site uh, use case. You do a require for this particular package, John P. Block slash WordPress. Uh, essentially, this is a composerified version of WordPress. Um, WordPress itself doesn't support Composer. Um, but John Block actually has created a repository where he sucks in the most recent versions of WordPress and makes sure that you can use it with Composer. John Block. Is it going to require to be on Slack? The, so I can post it. I post the link in Slack after. Right. Um, but yes, they will be. So then the next thing you'll need to do is actually make sure you set up something called W packages as a custom. Composer repository source. So essentially, Composer uses packagist.org by default for all the packages. Uh, somebody created something called W Packages, and basically, what it is is they've taken all of the themes and all of the plugins that are available on the WordPress.org repository, and they've made it available in a Composerified version or, or, or form. So, for example, things like Yoast SEO. You can actually just run composer require um, w packages dash plugin slash WordPress SEO, and you'll get the Yoast SEO plugin in your project. And um, you can even do an at stable version. Uh, and then anytime you run composer update, it'll go find the most recent version and install it in your project. How frequently is that up? And is it pretty close? To I've noticed time? occasionally. There, there'll be a little bit of lag between a new version coming out and it actually being here. But for the most part, it, it's not that long. Uh, so it stays up to date pretty well. The other thing you'll need is something called Composer Installers. So you'll run Composer Require Composer Installers. And basically what this does is it's a tool that actually works with a number of different platforms. WordPress just happens to be one of them. Um, and what it does is it will allow you to have, because of the way WordPress works, if I do a composer require for, say, the Yoast SEO plugin, if it goes in the vendor directory, then you can't actually activate that plugin in WordPress because it's in the wrong place. So what this will do is it will actually allow you to define where plugins need to go, where themes need to go, and uh, also where emu plugins, must use plugins, need to go. And basically, uh, after you've done all that, you'll stop by your composer.json file, and you'll define a few little things. And as you can see, what we're doing here is we're defining the WordPress install directory. So we're going to use an alternate WordPress uh, directory structure, so uh, things play, play nice with Composer, uh, and then WordPress works the way it should. Uh, so we're actually creating a special directory called WP, where we want WordPress to live. And then uh, we're also referencing where exactly we want our plugins to go, where we want our themes to go, and where we want our MU plugins to go. So if we have a composer uh, package, right? So think Yoast SEO. If we want to install that as a package, uh, when we use W packages, that particular package is, has a type property, which is defined as plugin or uh, WordPress plugin. And what we're doing here is we're saying anything with the type of WordPress plugin, drop it in our plugins directory uh, in a folder that's named after the package. Um, so that properly sets up all your dependencies in the right place. And anything that's not a WordPress plugin theme uh, will go into the vendor directory. Is the process 
Um, yeah, so multi-site will work the same way. You can define where you want things to go, um, and they'll go there. So if for some reason you've gone in to your WP config file and said all of my plugins live in this other directory, you would just update your composer file to point to that location, and now all your plugins are going there instead of the normal places they might have been. And, and could you define the location in the, in the, in the JSON file, right? Correct. Yeah, that's actually what we're doing here. So this this uh, JSON file lives in the root of our project, and uh, and this is just the relative path from the root uh, to where those things live. So this is the alternate uh, directory structure for those that might not be familiar. Uh, essentially, what we do so public HTML is just kind of like the web root, um, and normally in a typical WordPress install, you'll actually see. WordPress in that public HTML directory. You know, that's where your WP content, WP admin, uh, your WP config, and all that stuff would live. In this case, what we're actually doing is we're saying uh, WordPress is going to live all by itself in this WP directory. And then WordPress by default will actually go up one level if it doesn't find a WP config file and look there to see if there's one. So you can actually have your WP config file outside of that WP directory, and you can set everything up there. Uh, and so what we're doing, and you, have, you don't actually see the WP config file in this particular setup uh, at the moment, but I think it's just because I failed to get in that screenshot. But basically, uh, the vendor directory, that's where all of your non-WordPress libraries you might be using would end up. And then, uh, again, that content directory, which We've called it content, it could be WP content or my stuff or whatever you want to call it. Uh, essentially, we've referenced that as the content directory and we've defined that in our WP config file. So that WordPress will now check here for anything that's a plugin or a theme, must use plugin if you use that, etc. So one of the things that um, I like to do is make it easy to bootstrap new projects. Uh, so, you know, running all those commands that you need to do to kind of get things set up to use Composer with WordPress takes a little bit of time. And I like shaving, shaving things off my uh, workload and saving myself as much time as possible. So, there is this command called Composer Create Project, and then you can have a package uh, of your custom creation or something that somebody else has done. And basically when you run this command, it will download uh, this particular package. In this case, it will need to be registered at packages.org. And it will download it and actually run composer install against that package. So whatever uh, composer setup needs to happen for that, it actually runs it. The other thing it does is also removes version control from the thing that it just downloaded. Uh, so to kind of give you an example, uh, I have something called WP Skeleton. And when you run composer create project WP Scholar slash WP Skeleton, what it does is it has all of the WordPress uh, configuration set up. And it clones that down into whatever directory you happen to be in. It removes version control, but it keeps things like the git ignore file, which are already set up for this particular configuration. And it runs composer install, which will get things like WordPress itself, the Composer installers, and all the things that are needed for this to, to be ready to go for WordPress, uh, WordPress site. So you can run that single command. It will essentially set you up for a WordPress site using Composer. Uh, the directory structure will all be already be set up. Um, and all you have to do at that point is you can start, uh, you can navigate directly into that new directory. You can run WP, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, composer create project, or uh, composer require, and then any plugins <laughs> or even themes that you want to install, and they will, it'll automatically check that W packages uh, repo, because it's already set up in this thing that I've created. Uh, so you're basically ready to go if you run this one command to start using composer with WordPress really quickly and really easily. If you happen to be a little more advanced and you like to use something like, say, VBV for your local development, created something called uh, VBV Skeleton, which is essentially the same thing, 
Um, except it also does your VVV project setup. So you can run the single command. It gets WordPress, uh, WordPress project set up and ready to go. Creates your VVV configuration files. Um, you can then run require for any plugins you might want. Reprovision your virtual machine. And then you've got a working site. You can go to the domain and load it up uh, and set up your database and whatnot. So that is what I've got. Uh, are there any questions? So, um, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so when you do a composer install, can you do that again or no? You can run composer install as much as you want. Okay. Um, so let's say you just copy down a, a project uh, somebody else had set up, and you run composer install. It will it will fetch whatever's in that lock file. Um, so if you run it again, it just double checks to make sure that a you haven't deleted something out of your project, and b that you've got uh, you know all the same things that that lock file requires. We say the lock file, that would be like a big difference, like a big difference between Composer and uh, Bower. Correct, yeah. So the yeah, so just to repeat, the uh, the lock file is the big difference between uh, using tools like MDM or Bower. Um, added stuff. Yeah. Uh, so if you've added stuff to what folder? Uh, to one of the folders. In your example, in the WP content folder, or any of those folders managed by um, and uh, I run that. I run the include. Okay. Yeah. So just to repeat, uh, the question is, uh, if I actually go in and change uh, something in a directory that is managed by Composer, what would happen? Um, so if you, let's say WordPress is a dependency and you've required via Composer WordPress itself and you go in and you actually <coughs> hack away at WordPress, um, essentially what's happening is uh, when you run Composer install, it's checking the JSON, Composer JSON file just to make sure that that file um, indicates that you're um, using that package at a particular version. Um, and it usually uses uh, Git to kind of help with that. Uh, so if you go in and make changes to within a, a file that is actually a dependency itself, uh, usually those things won't get changed. You can go in and completely delete the WP directory where WordPress lives, and it will actually reinstall it if you run Composer install and it happens to be missing. So if you were let's say thinking maybe you got hacked and you just want to make sure that everything is the most recent and maybe you're using Composer on the production side or whatever the case may be, you could just delete it and then rerun Composer install and it would just reinstall everything. So if I add the, uh, add the files in the folder, it's not going to be So, but let's say if you're using Composer with WordPress and so it's actually uh, automatically installing plugins in the plugins directory, um, but you have premium plugins which aren't or five or whatever, and so you're actually just dropping them in and committing them to the repo. Uh, any changes that are made there aren't going to be impacted by anything that Composer does. Is there a way to register packages that are locally held on the system, like proprietary development, that aren't registered out on packages or something like that? Correct. So that's where, uh, let's say you have Bitbucket and you've got a repo there. You can run Composer init on that particular private repository and set up the uh, package name and uh, any meta information in there. Uh, and then in the project where you want to include that repository, you would run the command uh, to essentially register that repository the Git repository. And then you would do a normal require for the name of the package that's defined in that remote Composer config. And it will work as if it were on packages. Yeah. You mentioned like that different uh, WordPress directory setup. Uh, have you experienced any kashas or weirdness in terms of having things set up that way? 
Yeah, so the question is, um, are there any gotchas with having an alternate directory structure within Word, for WordPress? And um, so the gotcha is really, uh, makes it really easy to find plugins that are not properly coded uh, because there are a lot of plugins that expect a very specific directory structure, the one that everyone typically uses. Uh, and when they're coded wrong and you move something around, that plugin will break when your cycle crash. Uh, and it's a real good indicator to me that that was not well coded and that I should just find another plugin or write another write one, right? Uh, or go to the, at least go to the plugin <coughs> offer and be like, hey, you're doing it wrong. You know, WordPress does have other ways that it works and you need to make sure that your code is compatible uh, with these alternate structures. But yeah, it does happen, and sometimes uh, it's annoying, but the reality is that you actually end up usually with better code on your site. How, how common do you find that? It's not terribly common. Uh, and again, that's kind of one of those things where not too many plugins necessarily, uh, you know, usually, I don't know, it, it, happened, it can happen relatively often, but uh, I'm very picky about plugins, so it really doesn't happen very much to me, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so I guess your uh, mileage may vary depending on what you use. But. Any other questions? Yeah. I was wondering about uh, host hosting. <coughs> what hosts do you know of that do well with that you can use a poster on? So, um, so yeah, so I guess one of the things that uh, is notable is that my favorite host, Pantheon, uh, actually doesn't allow you to do an alternate directory structure. But I still use Composer with it, within WordPress. Uh, I just do it a slightly different way. Uh, so instead of, so with, with their, the way their stuff works is that everything has to be in the repository for it to um, actually run on Pantheon. Uh, but I'll still use Composer and uh, and I don't I don't include WordPress as a dependency. WordPress is already set up on Pantheon, so I just do the actual plugins themselves and have and map it within that directory structure, um, and it, it works fine. But yeah, I think I think most other web hosts will allow you to do whatever you want. But Pantheon has a, a really advanced um, uh, file mapping and and a bunch of different things that they do, and they. Currently, don't support alternate structures, but I think they uh, they might be doing that at some point. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, um, again, if you if you think of one after the fact, just hit me up on Slack or Twitter, and I'll get back to you. Thanks. <laughs>